As Russia and Ukraine inch closer to war, what's religious freedom like in both countries? This is episode 76 of En Route. to En Route, the podcast where we talk about the journey of faith and how it intersects with politics and modern life. My name is Dennis Sanders, and I am your host. So um, I'm recording this on Friday evening, February 18th. Um, This is probably unusual that I'm actually putting together the uh, podcast the same day that I've had an interview, but there is a reason for this, because in a few hours, or maybe in a few days, we just might see Russia invade its neighbor to the south, Ukraine. In a short news conference this afternoon, U.S. President uh, Joe Biden said, intelligence is indicating that Russian President Vladimir Putin has made up his mind to invade Ukraine, and he has set the capital of Kyiv in his sights. In 2016, Putin passed a law that basically made all religions, and Christian sects illegal unless they were registered by the government, though there were some religions that were made totally illegal. The Russian Orthodox Church was exempt from this law, and that's because they have the blessing of Putin and act as a de facto state church, which fits um, perfectly into Putin's nationalistic ideology. So today I'm talking with Brian Kaler. He is the editor of Word and Way magazine, and he is also the author of an article called uh, From Russia with No Love. It talks about religious freedom in Russia. Um, And we will also, um, we will talk about that article and the state of religious liberty in Russia today, how that relates to Christian nationalism here in the United States. And we're also going to be talking about what religion, religious liberty looks like in the Donbass region of Ukraine. This is located in the eastern part of the country, and the Donbass has been under control of Russian-backed rebels since 2014. And they are also dealing with a lack of religious freedom. But we'll hear more when we hear from Brian Kaler. Well, Brian, thank you for uh, taking the time to chat with me, uh, especially on this issue that is probably more pertinent now than ever before. Yeah, well, thanks, Dennis. I'm glad to be here with you. Uh, So one of the things that I think is fascinating is that um, what seems to be going on in Russia when it comes to religious freedom is a little different than what we would think it used to be. I think um, if those of us that grew up during the Cold War We always thought of Russia, it was kind of, and it's Soviet Union, really, as kind of, it was officially atheist, um, so religion was mostly underground. Russia today is very different. It's Mm -hmm. this type of religious, threats to religious freedom seems to be a different form than what it was, say, in the 1980s. Yeah, that's 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 a good way of putting it. So, you know, in in the 19, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, it, pretty much all religions were targeted, mm-hmm. all all branches of Christianity, other religious traditions. It was an officially atheistic state. What we have now is much more of a collusion between one church and the state, and that is the Russian Orthodox Church has a favored status. And so they have a lot of freedoms, they have a lot of power, they have a lot of influence, but then other religious traditions, including some other Christian traditions, but also Jehovah's Witnesses, Muslims are are being targeted with persecution. Over the last few years, we've seen this ramp back up 
for those. But yeah, it, it's not the, the like the the atheist communist government that mm-hmm. you and I grew up, you know, hearing yeah. about over in Russia. It's actually much more of a kind of a Christian nationalism with one only but only one branch of Christianity favored. So what has kind of brought that change? I mean, you know, I think also in the years when the Soviet Union um, dissolved, it seemed like there was just a huge influx of different faiths that came in. It was almost like this market of, of faiths. And then all of a sudden, in the last maybe 10, 15 years, it narrowed down basically just to the Russian Orthodox Church being the only approved religion. What brought that change? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know that I am up on all of the complexities and details, but I would say that Vladimir Putin is a big piece of this puzzle. Mm-hmm. Right? So, I mean, if you're, he is the dominant figure of Russian politics and Russian life over the past 10, 15 years. And uh, it, this has been part of his project of, in many ways, rebuilding a, a strong man approach to the Russian governance. And so in the Russian Orthodox Church, he has found a very willing and powerful ally. I mean, if, if you're wanting to build a strong, powerful state and you need to get an ally from a, from a religious group, you're, you're most likely going to connect with the largest faith tradition. And that's what the Russian Orthodox Church is. You know, it is the dominant faith. It is the, the church that most people would at least profess to be part of. And so it's a natural ally then for any politician that wants to, you know, have that that strength. And and he wants to almost baptize himself as a Christian leader. He talks about being the defender of Christianity. This is part of his play in elections. It's part of his play for power. And so he needs a church to help align him in that regard. So you brought up an interesting kind of word that we've used a lot here recently in the United States, and that is Christian nationalism. Um, and it seems like he is, uh, that, that Putin is using, I wouldn't, well, I probably shouldn't say using because it's, it's mutual, um, of the Russian Orthodox in, in a kind of nationalist bent. Um, how do you see, do you see any kind of similarities between what we're seeing happening here in the United States? Um, probably that was, came really to fruition in January 6th of last year and what's happening um, currently in in Russia. Yeah, there really are a lot of parallels. There's some interesting ideological parallels so that you'll find, we wrote about this at publicwitness.wordandway.org, uh, that there's some of the Christian nationalists in the United States, Franklin Graham, Senator Josh Hawley, Tucker Carlson, have, have for years really liked Vladimir Putin. And part of that is because they share an ideological agenda and they're they're opposed to Muslims, the LGBTQ community, and so they've had some some similarities there. But there's also then this this love for an author- authoritarian leader. Mm-hmm. There's this we we've seen that in white Christian nationalism in the United States is attracted to that authoritarian leader, and I think that that is because Christian nationalism is inherently anti democratic small d, anti-democratic. It needs a strong man. It needs an authoritarian figure to help codify these rules. Because when you start saying that one group of people has special privileges, that's not a democracy. That's not a democratic approach. So you're going to need a strong man, someone who doesn't believe in democracy. So there's definitely that parallel. But there's also the parallel that when we talk about white Christian nationalism in the United States, it's only part of Christianity that's getting that favored status if they're successful. And that's what we see, I think, already in place in Russia. And it's an important warning sign that if we were to become a, a Christian nationalist state in the United States, not all Christians would have the favored status. So not only would we find religious minorities like Muslims and Jews and others targeted or left out, uh, kind of excommunicated, if you will, from the body politic, we would find that some branches of Christianity would also find themselves targeted, which is happening in Russia. Pentecostals, Baptists are particularly being persecuted uh, and fined under R- Putin's regime right now. And so I think there's a lot of similarities and a lot of parallels there. So what is life like for people who are not Russian Orthodox, who are Christians or um Muslims, because I know that there is a, a large Muslim population in Russia, uh, Jewish, other religions. How are how are things, let's say, changed from maybe the early 90s um, to now? Yeah. 
So things really started to get worse in 2016, and that's when Putin signed a law that cracks down a lot of evangelistic and missionary activities. And a lot of it was couched in the sense of of dealing with extremist groups and terrorism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of this kind of, you know, rhetoric of like a war on terror can can be used then to target people who are not terrorists and are not violent. And and so in this new law, then uh, it particularly uh, hits non-registered houses of worship. And so in Russia, they have to register with the government. And so some faith traditions like Baptist, like Seventh-day Adventist, not only in Russia, but in other countries in that region that have similar government registration requirements for houses of worship, have historically refused to register. Mm -hmm. And it's part of their their ideological principles. They, they, They don't believe that the state has the right to declare who is a house of worship or not. So this new law has made them particularly vulnerable because it means that they're conducting unauthorized, unregistered evangelistic and missionary activities. And so that can result in fines. It has resulted in Christian campgrounds being shut down. It has resulted in seminaries are now being targeted. This is a a newer law that came. Uh, They started the Lutheran and Baptist and Pentecostal seminaries have had their essentially their state accreditation, if you will, uh, revoked. Um, And as a result, then then Putin signed a new law last year that says that if you're a clergy member and you received your education either from an unregistered school or from a foreign school, you went overseas somewhere else, then you have to take a class on state confessional relations in Russia. And Mm. so basically it means you're going to have to go take a class at a school of the Russian Orthodox Church about church-state relations from their perspective. So all of these laws then give Russian officials the opportunity to target anyone who's, who's evangelizing. We've had four missionaries have been deported uh, for violating this law. And so it, it really what I've heard from some Russians over there is part of the problem is they don't actually know what they're doing that could get them in trouble or not. Right. There, because there's, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty with the law that basically if a Russian official wants to target your house of worship, particularly if you're unregistered, then there's a lot of things you could maybe do that might get you in trouble and you don't know always where the line is. And so there's kind of always that moment where you're wondering, are they going to come, you know, arrest our pastor today for this service? You know, if we baptize someone in the sanctuary versus in the Creek and, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty with the law. Um, Have there been people that have been arrested for breaking the law? Oh, yes. There have been hundreds of people. Uh, we're seeing over 100, sometimes 200 every single year. And again, this started in 2016. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll give you a few examples that we wrote about at a public witness. In the very first year of the law, there were 193 cases that were brought, 143 convictions. And these targeted, targeted 63 Pentecostal cases, 43 cases against Jehovah's Witnesses, 31 against Baptists. Uh, there were 159 prosecutions in 2018. We've seen similar paces in 2019, 2020. The numbers are often slow and hard to get out uh, on Mm -hmm. this. And then adding to this since then, in in 2017, the Russian Supreme Court actually banned Jehovah's Witnesses completely. They're even more targeted now than Pentecostals and Baptists. They've been declared an illegal extremist group. And so there's been a significant crackdown with not just now you know, fines and shutting down campgrounds and seminaries, but they're actually having some significant jail times to Jehovah's Witnesses simply for practicing their faith. Your talk about the how basically dealing with the uncertainty reminds me, it's a different situation, but about 20 years ago um, when I was in seminary, we uh, went to um, southwestern China, so it was Yunnan province. And when we went to visit, we always had to go with the government. The, they were, the, you know, we couldn't go anywhere without them. And there was one image I can remember on a Sunday, we were in a a church um, and our professor, who was a missionary kid from China, um, was not preaching. He was doing something else because preaching was evangelism that was illegal. Um, But the thing I remember, there was a choir uh, um, from that local church 
And sitting at the front were the people from the government. One of them was this guy dressed kind of, it looked like a kind of an old Maoist uniform. And he just sat there incredibly sternly. And the people in the choir were just frightened. Um, not really, I mean, and that's just something that, that was, it was fascinating to see that because while they were able to worship, it was always with uncertainty um, of what was what could happen, what what might not happen. You know, it, so it, I know this is a, it's like I said, totally different different country, but it seems very similar. That uncertainty that you can't just worship and not worry that the state could come down on you. Yeah, and I don't think that's an uncommon approach by these authoritarian governments. We've seen that in some of the former Russian uh, bloc nations that have were free when the Soviet Union broke, and some of them have more freedoms. Others are very much like Putin or even worse with their authoritarian crackdowns on churches, uh, the uneven um, in enforcement of the laws. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, it, it's kind of, you know, who, who has relation, good friendly relations with local officials. Some congregations might be more targeted than others. I've, I've seen, you know, similar types of issues in visits with churches in Cuba. So another communist, you know, government, mm -hmm. you know, would, would probably be a bit more akin to your experience in China. And, and, and I think that that uncertainty is is part of uh, the goal of the authoritarian government. They want you to always be on edge because they want you to know that if they want to, they could find something. They could come down and give you a fine or crack down on something. And a lot of times, one of the, they, like well, some of the ways they targeted the Baptist Seminary in Moscow, you know, wasn't about you know theological issues. They, they you know they came in and said you know this this building now suddenly you know has all of these deficiencies and you needed to spend tens of thousands or more dollars to get it up to code, even though it had just passed code and now suddenly there was a new inspection and now suddenly it didn't make it right and so mm. you know they're not even always honest about why they're shutting you down mm. so what do you think is behind i mean is this a way of for putin especially to stay in power um to kind of get on the good sides of people people who may have a sense of patriotism um to russia that if he does this, he favors the Russian Orthodox. That helps him in future elections. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to get too far down the road of like peering into the soul of, of Putin. And, <laughs> and, and I mean, I know well, I think George W. Bush claimed that he had looked into the eyes of Putin and saw his soul, but I, I won't I won't go that far no. in my analysis. But judging a, a, a tree by its fruit. I, you know, I, there, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of religious sincerity, let's say, in 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 Putin's life. And so I do think it's about power. It's about raw political power at its core. I mean, that's what he's about, that he's he's you know maneuvered Russian constitution and other laws to find new ways of staying in power and keeping power and gaining power. And so I do think it's it, it is for him all about power. And, uh, and unfortunately, it's not just corrupting the state and it's not just resulting in the persecution of some religious minorities, Christians and others, but it's also corrupting the Russian Orthodox Church. I, I, mean, I mean, in some ways, some of their leaders have been willingly partners with them. But, you know, now when someone protests Putin's government, it is also a protest. It is also a critique of the Russian Orthodox Church because they are in many ways one and the same. I've written about this in the past, not in our more recent piece at a public witness, but uh, you might recall the, the, the feminist punk rock group that they mm -hmm. you know, wear the, the mask and so forth. Yeah. When, so they were arrested for some of their political protests against Putin. And this was actually even before this is back in like 2012. This is before the anti-missionary anti-evangelism uh, laws. So this is before things got even worse on the religious liberty front, but their, their main protest, the one that really got them arrested and imprisoned uh, was actually, it was a song they sung in the form of a prayer, and they filmed it in a Russian Orthodox church and one that had close ties to Putin because mm. they recognized that to critique Putin is to critique the government church and vice versa. And so they realized that if we wanted a, a change in leadership, political leadership in Russia, it was also going to involve a change in the Russian Orthodox Church. And so in many ways now, they have been wedded together so that to critique one is a rebuke of the other as well. 
is there any sense of change or people who are, I don't know, dissidents within the Russian Orthodox Church who think that this isn't the way to go? Or is it pretty much, is that dissent kept under wraps? That's a good question. I don't know if I can I can speak to that very well. I, I will say one of the things that has been interesting in this conflict with the with Russia and Ukraine is uh, a couple of years ago we saw the Ukrainian. So the Ukrainian Orthodox Church historically had been under the the Russian patriarch. Mm -hmm. So in the Orthodox Church traditions, there are various unions, and so you've had the Moscow patriarch has been a significant one, really the most significant one, uh, outside of Constantinople, the main Orthodox uh, patriarch and union. And so uh, with some of the stuff that has been happening the last several years with the conflicts on and off, you know, we had you know issues in 2014, there's been elections, there's been protests, there's been a lot of stuff happening in Ukraine because of Russian interference and attempts to push off Russian interference that the the Orthodox Church there was facing criticism because of their connection with Russia, who was mm. this enemy that was harming the state. And so they actually now have a Kiev patriarch. It's a breakaway, essentially. And so the mm. Orthodox Church is splintering in some ways and is, is, isn't holding together very well because of the geopolitical conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And I, that's what I mean. It's one of those things I think is really unfortunate when you start to see this. Then is the 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 man made borders between Russia and Ukraine are are dividing a church that had long been together, and mm -hmm. and, and it's happening because one branch of that church was was putting a nationalistic priority ahead of. So rather than the Orthodox Church being united as Christians first. They were they were coming together as Russians first, and so then the Ukrainians, I think, rightfully felt like uh, they were they were you know aliens in their own church, and so they needed then their own community, and they had to separate. And so this is what happens with Christian nationalism: the boundaries of the state, the boundaries of the nation, become our the one that we we pledge first allegiance to, become our top priority. And then that means we're more, we see ourselves more like our fellow Americans or our fellow Russians than we do our fellow Christians on the other side of the border. Hmm. Coming back to the United States, one of the things that, again, I think going back to growing up as I did in the 80s, especially within evangelical culture, there was a lot of um, maybe support for kind of the underground church um, back then. And now it seems that that's not the case. I, mean, I, I there are some, and I think you, in your article you talk about Brown, Sam Brownback being one of them. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the the bigger celebrities or people that we know within um, evangelical uh, culture in the United States seem to be f favoring um, Putin and the Russian government. What has changed? Because that was such a big hallmark of, of, I think, evangelicalism during the Cold War. And now that's just not, that's gone. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's a great question because it is frustrating. I, I've been surprised by how little attention the persecution of Christians and other religious minorities in Russia has received over the last, you know, five years, six years. Uh, and, and and for that matter, also we haven't talked about it as much, but it's it's even worse in the eastern Ukrainian regions that Russian-backed separatists have been, you know, controlling by violent force since um, 2014. Yeah, we will we'll get, get there that. in a minute. So, so there's <laughs> that you know, there's a lot of persecution happening here in that region, and it's surprising how little attention that has gotten. And I really think the problem is the government which is doing the persecution. So before it was this, you know, atheist communist government, right? And that, mm -hmm. I mean that's our classic enemy in American Christianity is we're going to we're going to we're going to beat the godless atheists. Uh, we put under God in the pledge of allegiance and you know during the Cold War, we mm -hmm. did that for a reason. God was on our side, not on the communist side. And, and so I think that was an easy uh, easy group to back. But because of the affinity that some of the Christian nationalists, like Franklin Graham, who who has partnered with the Russian government and has pray, I mean, he put he put Putin on the cover of Decision Magazine, the magazine of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, in 2014, literally as the Russians are taking over Eastern Ukraine. 
and and continues to praise him. He'll 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 defend Putin and attack Biden on Twitter, you know, from you know, quite frequently whenever the, the topics come up. You know, this is I think that they have bought into this idea of this desire for this Christian nationalist strongman that they're willing to overlook the persecution and they want to ignore it because they've already decided they like Putin. And that type of hypocrisy is problematic, but I also think it shows that they're really less concerned about Christian persecution or religious liberty than they are about control and power, just like mm-hmm. Putin is. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, we've seen this throughout our history. You know, the, per- the, the Puritans fled religious persecution. They didn't actually believe in religious liberty because once they got here, they, they, they start the Massachusetts Bay Colony and start persecuting other Christians, right? Roger Williams mm-hmm. gets banished. The others get banished because of the religious beliefs. They, they, they didn't like persecution of themselves, but they weren't opposed to it inherently. And I, I think what we're seeing is that a lot of those that were standing up for the persecuted church in Russia really weren't as concerned about persecution as they were anti-communist. And, and their, their, their support, not just their silence on the issue, but their support of Putin's regime uh, is, is incredibly troubling today. And how do you think that affects their witness here? Because that, that has to have some kind of a, an effect of some way that you're basically having these people support a regime that's really clamping down on people because of their faith. Mm-hmm. It's, it, you know, having people who are of faith, clamp, you know, supporting someone who's clamping down on people of faith just can't really be a good thing for the church. No, it can't be. I mean, I think the main thing they have going for them is is how little attention that we have paid to this, this issue, which is why I, I'm glad that you're having this conversation, because uh, we need to have more attention to what's happening to our fellow Christians and other, you know, persecuted religious minorities. I, I do think it, it probably has a greater impact on their witness in countries where they're paying attention, you know, mm-hmm. to these these types of issues. They see the contradiction there. They see the support for the regime that is persecuting them. Um, but yeah, I, I, it, it's not good for the witness. It's not good for the unity of the church. Mm-hmm. And it is, uh, it is, it's frustrating to see uh, people today, perhaps partly out of ignorance, but perhaps out of, you know, misguided priorities and approach are continuing to, to at least defend, if not even praise and support Putin's regime. Mm-hmm. So you, we talked, um, and, and in the article, you also talked a little bit about what was going on um, in um, eastern Ukraine, in the Donbass. Um, and there, that's, um, for people who don't know, it's kind of where um, Russian-backed rebels um, have basically effectively taken control of that area. And it seems like from what you have found out, that type of of repression is leaking into those parts of, of Ukraine as well. And, and that is even worse than what it, it is. is. It's in, even, in it's Russia even itself. worse. Yeah. And again, this is one of those areas that, that I'm, I'm glad that we can talk about because it's really important. I've had the opportunity to meet Baptists, particularly uh, through the Baptist World Alliance from Ukraine and Russia, a- including uh, some Baptist pastors who were ministering in eastern Ukraine before mm-hmm. 2014 when the Russian-backed separatists violently took the region. Um, I've had a chance to speak several times with Yelisey Pronin, a, a pastor who was in eastern Ukraine and actually stayed and ministered for a while uh, there in the war zone. He's written about it in uh, a, a book, Chronicles of Undeclared War. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's a, he takes you into and reminds you just how devastating war can be, which I think is an important note before we get into the persecution as 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 it looks like Russia might want to start another war in Ukraine, you know, we need to be I think prayerfully mindful that this is not good, that war will will result in massive loss of life. It will result in the destruction of the infrastructure and the economy and so much more in Ukraine that could take decades at least for them to recover from. And the eastern Ukrainian region is is still suffering under that violent oppression uh, from the destruction from the war and the ongoing you know, rebel governments that, that are leading that. And they have then also taken their persecution to a whole nother level. So they have they also have the rules about government registration, but then they didn't even allow Baptist churches to register at all 
because mm. the Ukrainian Baptist Union had spoken out against the occupation and the rebel governments. And so they declared them extremist. They have shut down all of the churches uh, there, the Baptist churches there. They have started banning, and this happens in Russia and some of the other countries as well. They've started, but they have more in the eastern Donbass region. They have uh, banned books including uh, a book by Billy Graham is banned, a book by Charles Spurgeon is banned, a, a gospel song book, and even a translation of the book of John. The biblical book of John was banned as extremist uh, in, in, in one of the regions of Donbass that is controlled by the, the Russian uh, back separatists, uh, which is, you know, if we really want to start to think about it, it might be kind of interesting to think about, you know, what, what does the gospel of John teach? And, and maybe to a violent oppressive regime, right? It is not a, it is not a supporting message. Like nope. maybe if we would start actually practicing out and living out the gospel of John and the other writings, uh, you know, maybe authoritarians everywhere would start viewing us as extremists. So I, I think it's, it's actually a little concerning when they don't view, they don't view us as extremists when the authoritarian regimes don't see the Bible as uh, a threat because it was all written practically under oppression and in uh, the prophets speaking out against the oppressive regimes of, of kings and pharaohs and tyrants. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a really significant problem. Um, it's hard to get information in and out of the region. I, I know a number of leaders in the area who have been able to communicate and even provide uh, some support to some of the pastors who have remained and are continuing to minister in essentially, you know, illegally there in very difficult circumstances. Um, but it's a it's a troubling um, area that I think it should be a warning for if something happens between Russia and Ukraine now, this is a warning of what we could see happen to more parts of Ukraine. And uh, w- w- this is this is a serious problem. And, that, and that's what really, really frustrates me then about uh Christian leaders and politicians in the United States that are defending Putin right now is this is this is what they're defending. They're defending this type of occupation and repression and persecution. Do you know if um, the situation is the same in Crimea, since that was also a region? Well, that wasn't even by Russian backed militias that was actually basically invaded by Russia. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, Crimea is so that you basically have like three three parts. There's two two uh, republics or two regions inside of, of Donbass, and those two we kind of put together. They're being you know occupied violently by Russian backed separatists. Crimea in 2014 as well was just fully annexed, right? And so you know the international community, the United States, the United Nations, pretty much most countries still consider that to be Ukrainian territory. Uh, they say the annexation was illegal, but because it was annexed into Russia proper, as opposed to being ruled by Russian-backed separatists, they're, they're, they fall under all of the laws we were already talking about. The 2016 law then on evangelism and missionary activities is being applied in Crimea, and we are seeing it essentially being uh, implemented in Crimea, Crimea in the same ways that it is throughout other parts of Russia. So they're not having the more violent repression and persecution in the other two parts of eastern Ukraine, but they are they are seeing the same religious persecution that we are seeing elsewhere in Russia. Okay. So what can Americans kind of do um, to respond to this? Um, obviously, you know, we're on the other side of the world um, and may feel like we don't have much to offer, but what can be done... Um, by normal people to just want to do something they hear about this and they want to help? I mean, that's an important question. It's also a hard question. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know, I'll be honest that it, it, it's, it is sometimes hard to find hope because we've been watching the situation, you know, drag on for seven or eight years now. I mean, as, as a Christian minister, I would first of all, of course, say that we should be praying you know, for our brothers and sisters who are suffering under persecution in Russia and Eastern Ukraine. Uh, But I also think we do need to do more. And I know that's what you're asking is, you know, Mm -hmm. what can we do beyond praying? And I think one of the, one of the, the first obviously important steps is that we just have to be informed, which is why I was really excited when you reached out to have this conversation, because it's important. We need to be talking about, it's the, um, it reminds me of what, uh, 
John Lewis uh, wrote a uh, it, it, it talked about there was a time when he was being uh, put in prison. I think it was in Louisiana, and uh, uh, as the guard is shutting the the the, the gates, makes a, a, a sneering comment about how the press can't see you now, the media can't see you now, and he thought he was going to die that night because he was out of sight. Mm-hmm. And he makes a comment about how important it was for the, the, the press to be paying attention to the civil rights movement because that kept them alive. It kept the movement growing and, and going. And so I think it's a great reminder that authoritarians, those that are pushing persecution, whether it be religious like we're talking about or the racial persecution that John Lewis was facing, that they thrive in darkness. They want they they don't they want people not to pay attention. And so if we have, whether it be ignorance or apathy, if we're not paying attention, it makes it easier for the persecution to happen. And so we have to be talking about it. There are some organizations that do a good job of trying to uh, report on this. Uh, One of them is Forum 18. We cite them in a public witness. They have done, I think, about the best job of trying to track these various cases of how many people are being persecuted in in Russia and Eastern Ukraine and and what are some of the examples of the case. They also look at several other countries in that region as well. So I think it's important that we're reading about it and then talking about it. I would encourage pastors, uh, and it's not something you have to, you know, do in a sermon. Maybe you don't feel like it's something that you, you, but it's something that you can mention, you know, in a prayer time. Mm-hmm. From the pulpit, there are other parts of the service besides just the sermon that can be used to educate congregants. And so especially right now when people are hearing about it on the news, they're hearing about Russia and Ukraine, uh, their worldview is being framed by cable news conversations about Russia and Ukraine. What they need is pastors helping remind people that, hey, we have fellow members of our body. We're going to be taking communion today. We have fellow members of that body who are in communion with us, who maybe maybe in a secret church today are taking communion as well, but we are united as one body with them. That is, I think, really important that that time of in Sunday helps us transcend these boundaries and borders so that we see ourselves not as Americans first, but as Christians first, which means that we are in uh, in the same body, that we are in the same group as these persecuted Christians in Russia and Eastern Ukraine and elsewhere. And so education, that global perspective, not only does it help them with this situation, that just helps us fight against Christian nationalism. Right? Mm-hmm. When we're talking about Christians in other countries and why it's so important to hear from them and to learn from them, that helps us not be so you know, nationalistic, self-focused in our own congregations as well. Beyond that, I mean, there might be some ways that we can advocate in the public conversations coming up. I don't know. We'll have to watch and track. But I, I think the most important step that we've got to do is broaden our horizons and get, get informed, talk about these issues in our churches. Um, there's a number of ministries that do have uh, connections already in that region, particularly if war breaks out. We need to be providing relief and aid and development uh, and so I would encourage people to connect with their denominational relief bodies who will hopefully have some sort of connections in the region. But I don't know. It feels like a, a small drop in the bucket compared to what needs to be done. But mm-hmm. uh, I don't think we can just we can just forget about it to say there's nothing we can do, because that's exactly what the authoritarian leaders want us to do. Why do you think that this has not received so much attention? Because I have to admit, I didn't know as much about this. I mean, I, I knew some of the, the the laws and all this, but I didn't know the extent. Um, I didn't know what was happening in um, eastern Ukraine, even though I, I try to follow what's been going on. Why has that not received as much attention as it should? Yeah, I mean, obviously we could do a critique of media uh, and, you know, we get so focused on you know the latest celebrity scandal or the the you know latest political controversy and that we don't get to the international coverage in as much depth some of that's the media some of that's our fault we we change the channel right when the international news comes on and so that's part of the probably part of the problem uh, part of it might just that we have become so siloed i mean honestly if i wasn't engaged with the Baptist world alliance mm-hmm. i probably wouldn't know what was happening right and so it's because i have met 
Baptists from Russia and Ukraine and heard from them in person uh, what's happening that I started paying attention and trying to read more and to write more and to speak about it. And so, you know, we've, we've got to find ways to connect with the global church better. And, and I think too often, not just in our media, but in our churches, in our nominations, uh, America first is kind of the, the attention, right? Not mm. that we would necessarily always say we prioritize or that we think America is better, but it's all that we seem to care about uh, too often. And so, I, I assume it's just that it's just hard to break through uh, the cycle, but you know, it's it's been it's been going on for several years, and you know, it's important that we talk about it, especially now with the, the you know the chance of things flaring up even worse. But you know, when this new cycle ends, we need to still be remembering that the persecution will be continuing. Mm-hmm. You know, let's let's say hopefully Putin decides not to invade, the the media will move on. But we need to remember that the persecution hasn't stopped at that point. So we're talking right now on Friday morning, um, and we keep hearing that an invasion could be very much likely. Um, And there are, of course, different things that are are showing up, you know, field hospitals that are being set up on borders and all of this. Um, Is the church in the rest of Ukraine concerned about what could happen. Um, war, of course, but also that what they are seeing in, in eastern Ukraine could happen in their parts of, of the country as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And yeah, it is, I mean, it's important to the time da- st- stamp what our conversation is. And, um, you know, the Winter Olympics are coming to an end in, in a couple of days. Mm-hmm. And uh, the 2014 action in Crimea and the eastern Ukrainian regions happened right at the end of the Winter Olympics. The invasion of the country of Georgia by Putin in what 2008 happened right after the Olympics. So, I mean, it does feel like it's a the, it, we're in a, a critical next week or so kind of moment. So, yes, yeah, so the, the 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 Christians in Western Ukraine, I think, have. Um, a, a couple of key concerns. One concern would obviously be the worst case scenario, and that would be Russia rolling in and taking over the entire nation. Um, I don't don't think it would quite go that far. I think there's more of a concern that there might be essentially two Ukraines that maybe, you know, not just the regions that are occupied, but even then a greater swath would have some sort of Russian backed state or even Russia proper at that point that, but Western Ukraine itself might be protected uh, to some extent. Um, But so that what that would do though, would be that would create not only more areas of where the work would be under threat of persecution it would also create more refugees, uh, both internally displaced within Ukraine and refugees. So one of the things that is happening right now in Western Ukraine is they are preparing to welcome in those that will be internally displaced. I mean, from those two regions in the Donbass that we were talking about earlier, uh, it's something like over 2 million people have fled that region since 2014. Um, a little more than half of them are still in Ukraine. And so Yelisei Pronin, the, the pastor that I talked about, he's in Western Ukraine. He has a mm-hmm. church there. He teaches at the seminary uh, in Western Ukraine. And so, you know, he's considered internally displaced, right? He's been forced to leave his 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 home, but he's still in his country. And then not quite half, but, you know, close to a million have actually fled into other countries as refugees. So when I had an opportunity in 2019 to visit with Baptists in Poland, uh, one of the the Polish Baptist ministers was actually from Eastern Ukraine and had fled with the violence that had occurred, occurred there, and he was ministering to Ukrainian refugees living in Poland. Mm-hmm. And so we will see that that migration both to Western Ukraine and to other countries, uh, which is a disruption economically, emotionally, spiritually for these people. And so I think there's a lot of concern. Uh, right now in Western Ukraine, and they are trying to gear themselves up to be ready for that immediate humanitarian uh, relief to people who would be displaced by war. One of, the, if you remember, kind of one of the, the demands that um, Putin made was that he wanted NATO to basically leave all of the lands that um, that they, that they have been in. I, I think basically going to pre-1997, um, which on the one hand seems like an incredibly silly thing to ask, but that also has to have certain countries nervous. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And so I'm thinking about Poland, which is borders Ukraine, um, and also the Baltic states. Um, are people are are people of faith in those countries concerned of what could happen um, as they're seeing what uh, designs Russia has on on Ukraine that it may turn their its sights on their countries next. Yeah, I mean, so you have generations that are still there in Poland, for instance, that, I mean, they remember Mm -hmm. World War II. They remember the communist era. And it's not just all the persecution that happens and the devastating impact of war on the region. I mean, Poland and Ukraine, but but Poland, where I was visiting, was just devastated by the back and forth marching of armies. Uh, The borders were all changed. Uh, with the war, and, and you know, one of the most you know, interesting ways of that is uh, I was uh, I got to visit the birth home of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, hmm. the German theologian who was born in Germany, but his home now sits in Poland. Hmm. And so World War II literally changed the, the the borders of of where things were, and so you know they know the the devastation that war has. And that there are no winners in war, like, you know, the, that the, they they all lose. And so I think that they're all very concerned because it's still a raw wound in their in their their psyche and their communities. Uh, they they grew up hearing their parents or their grandparents talk about the devastation of the war and the persecution of the communist regime. So I think they understand this much better than we do. And I recognize the concerns of of the the threat of an authoritarian ruler like Putin much better than we do. Um, I think earlier we talked about the fact that um, someone that has been at least speaking out has been um, someone like Sam Brownback, who is the former U.S. senator and governor of Kansas. What has he been doing that has basically sounded the alarm? Um, and are people listening? Yeah, so as as Donald Trump's U.S. ambassador for international freedom, uh, he was calling out Russia for religious persecution. He called on them to release their their political prisoners, and that was you know a really important voice in the Trump administration uh, that was actually critical of the Russian government. And we've seen also uh, Biden's administration and State Department has 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 continued that message. And so there really is a bipartisan message here mm-hmm. of government officials who who have cared about human rights and religious freedom um, and, and aren't getting caught up in just some of the more, you know, politics, uh, domestic politics of it and using using Russia. So that's that really is important. And those voices, unfortunately, I don't think get as much attention as they should and need to be lifted up. But it's 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 important to recognize that this is something we should all be united on. That we should all be standing up for basic human rights, for religious freedom. Uh, it does happen to include some Christians in eastern Ukraine and Russia, um, but at the same time, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses and others are uh, actually the most persecuted. And so, even if it was just them, w- our government should be speaking out for religious freedom. Our churches should be demanding re- religious freedom because once you have a regime that can declare a religious group as extremist terrorist and can ban them as Russia has done in Jehovah's Witnesses, they can use that exa- exact same law to target anybody they want to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so that's why we have to stand up for religious liberty for all people uh, and not just for you know our own tribe. And so it, it's, it's important to see, you know, figures like Brownback, like uh, current Blinken that are, that are pushing this, uh, you know, the, the, the Biden administration has actually put Russia on the top list of worst religious freedom violators, mm. uh, we have a list, and there's there's a, there's a tiered list. And Russia had been on the second tier, but uh, as of last fall, now they are in the top ten list of the the worst countries in the world when it comes to uh, egregious violations of religious uh, freedom. And so that's an important step to see our government speaking out like that. Is there any type of action taking place in Congress right now? I mean, it's a great question. I can't speak authoritatively to that. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not. I'm not sure. I mean, obviously, if there's a an invasion, there's been a lot of threat of more sanctions and and some other sort of efforts. But I'm not sure there's anything that has come recently because of the religious persecution side. Okay. Well, as we kind of get 
closing to wrap this up, one of the things that um, a question that I would want to say is there are people out here listening to this, and I'm hoping learning about this important um, topic. What would you say to someone who is listening to this that wants to do something? How can they get involved? What, what can they do to speak up? Yeah, so that, that is a great question. I, I mentioned earlier that that you, you need to be educating yourself. Um, Form18.org is uh, uh, in its forum, and then the numbers 18.org just for basic information um, is you know one particular site. Finding these news sites that particularly are more international focused um, is helpful in understanding what's happening in the situation. And I would encourage you to reach out to, you, you know, your own denominational relief organization. So and many denominations also do advocacy for religious freedom, reach out to those and, and find out, Hey, what are we doing in this region already? Um, and, and, and if they're not, you know, one, you can encourage them to, but then you could also find another ministry that is, uh, you know, there find, find somebody who's already been on the ground, Mm -hmm. Uh, for years, because that means they have the local connections, they have the local infrastructure, they're already connected with the community. Well, you know, if, if, you know, if war happens, we don't want to just give our support to, you know, some group that's suddenly showing up right now. So find Mm -hmm. a, find an organization, find a ministry that's already been connected uh, for some time and try to learn out more from them. And then, you know, I think there's also a, a, a place here for religious bodies to speak out. And so if you have an opportunity within your own denominational structure, you know, I, I work with the Baptist World Alliance on writing resolutions, and they've had a couple of resolutions, both on Russian persecution and on the persecution in eastern Ukraine over the last few years. And so as denominational meetings are happening, uh, perhaps maybe even in person, uh, you know, for the first time in a few years, this could be an opportunity to raise this topic among more people as well. Okay. Um, could you tell people a little bit about um, where they can find you online? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so the piece that we've been talking about from Russia with no love is something we published at publicwitness.wordandway.org. A public witness is our subscriber e-newsletter of Word and Way. We're a publication that's been based in Missouri since 1896. I've been here wow. for about five and a half years, but we have a long, rich history of uh, informing and inspiring Christians with news and commentary. So you can find us at wordandway.org. We have a monthly magazine. We have podcast Dangerous Dogma. And then, like I said, we have the subscriber e-newsletter where we particularly do these long, deep dives on issues of faith, culture, and politics. And that's at publicwitness.wordandway.org. All right. Well, thank you for um, taking the time and to, as I said earlier, to talk about this important issue. It's an issue that a lot of us don't know about. And I think especially with everything going on, we need to. So thanks so much for for, um, being able to chat today. Yeah, well, thanks, Dennis. I really appreciate it. This was a really good conversation. All right. Take care. for Brian that he was on hand to inform us of this very pertinent issue. And um, I hope that more people start to talk about it. Um, Before I wrap things up, I was checking on Twitter, as I've been doing a lot lately, kind of to see what updates are happening with Ukraine. And someone talked about the fact that, um, as I said this earlier at the beginning of this show, Um, uh, President Putin is looking, looks like it's very, very closer to invading and he has the capital of Ukraine, Kiev, um, in its sights. And the the capital city of of Kiev is um, 2.9 million people. That's slightly larger than Chicago. So... I guess what I would offer that if you're listening to this, 
late Friday evening or early Saturday morning that you say a prayer for the people of Ukraine and for our world. Because if the invasion happens, things will change. Uh, as we end this podcast, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, do make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, the links are in the show notes. Uh, you can visit nrootpodcast.org. Um, we'll try to place some additional material about each podcast episode. And if you have a question or comment, please consider dropping me uh, a line at reverendpodcast at gmail.com. I really do want to hear your questions and comments, so please send those emails. Um, also, consider leaving a rating or, or a review on your podcast app. Um, kind of like everything else that's uh, these days online runs on an algorithm. So the more positive reviews and ratings, the easier it is for people to find this podcast. And um, it's important to have a podcast like this that I think takes a look at uh, mainline Protestantism um, with both a critical uh, and a curious eye. And um, I need your help to make that message spread. Um, and also, if you can, share this podcast with someone you know who might be interested. Um, I also want to, I said this a few um, last two episodes ago, um, to thank um, those who have uh, given donations. It means a lot. And you can make a donation by using the link that's in the description. Um, your donations do help to cover some of the costs associated with this podcast, and it is greatly appreciated. So that is it for this episode of Enroute, Journeys on Faith and Modern Life. I'm Dennis Sanders, your host. Take care, Godspeed, and I will see you soon. <laughs>